the dumbest electrician you can find knows more about energy than the average politician. My guest today is Ken Braun. I am a researcher for the Capital Research Center, uh, capitalresearch.org. We are a uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, investigative think tank. Our primary job is kind of to follow the money and influence in politics. Uh, we have a website, a Wikipedia-style web webpage with very neutral language um, research uh, profiles uh, called influencewatch.org. And we use that to track uh, nonprofit spending, political action committees, um, the whole the whole deal. So if you uh, wonder who's trying to change public policy in your neck of the woods or in Congress, we usually have a profile of them. And uh, we do uh, outside of that, we have a magazine where we do um, and a blog where we um, discuss some of these matters um, in, a, in less dry form than our uh, Influence Watch website. OK, and you've exposed some stuff way before the mainstream media got to it, correct? Uh, oh yeah, we, we uh, well, one of our more recent items was uh, a group called Arabella Advisors, which received some attention in the mainstream media, but or not not really in the mainstream media. Some burblings out from like the Washington Free Beacon and uh, groups like that. Uh, Arabella Advisors is a you know a, a multi billion dollar operation that funds left leaning NGOs and politicians that very few people have ever heard of. Uh, you hear about the dark money. Uh, that supposedly funds the the right center side of the political spectrum. Arabella Advisors is vastly larger than any of those. And uh, we've done extensive work um, on Arabella's influence uh, over the political system. Okay. And I was just watching a podcast you did with Hugo Kruger talking mm -hmm. about the NGO industrial complex. I don't yep. know if you want to talk about that a little bit here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so earlier this summer, I spent a lot of time um, researching primarily for the aforementioned Influence Watch, where you can find profiles of, of all these groups and a, a profile called Opposition to Nuclear Energy. Uh, I tabulated all the 990s from all of the nonprofits that have an explicit anti-nuclear energy position. And I came up with $2.3 billion in annual revenue for these groups. Um, you know, the top ones on the list are like the World Wildlife Fund. World Resource Institute, Environmental Defense Fund, Natural Resources Defense Council, Sierra Club, League, you know, League of Conservation Voters, all the, all the famous ones, some that you've never heard of or rarely heard of called, you know, like the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a uh, gained some notoriety lately for trying to take away everyone's gas stoves. Um, but also on the list are some groups you wouldn't believe have anti-nuclear positions and, and pretty strident ones like the League of Women Voters and then the NAACP. I mean, what are they doing worrying about stopping a clean, carbon-free, safe energy source? Yet there they are. Both of them have very strident anti-nuclear positions. League of Women Voters going back decades. Um, so anyway, I posted that. And uh, like I said, there's a profile. There's a an essay explaining the uh, the list, and then there's a profile on our webpage called Opposition to Nuclear Energy. I think I came up with 200 some odd such groups. Every single one of them is profiled on our webpage. I probably didn't get them all. Um, there's probably more out there. It stuns me, as I said, there's some groups you just never would have believed have this position. There's probably more of them out there. So 2.3 billion is a conservative list of, uh, of, of this uh, group. So do you have a sense of why they would do this? I cannot figure it out at all. Why? Well, uh, you know, I think um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, propaganda over many decades about the the dangers of nuclear power, um, you know, ridiculous exaggerations of the dangers of nuclear power. The precautionary principle is at work there. People just want to stop anything that could ever be harmful. And I think, you know, there's just a, a, a poor understanding of risk in, 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 in society that's been going on for decades. That's part of it. Um, I think the industry itself has suffered from some deliberately negative PR from on the one side, NGOs and movements that just want to prohibit energy and economic growth and, and things of that nature. Very, very left-leaning perspective and probably some on the other on the industry side, trying to, to squeeze out the competition, um, you know, they're, they're the the it, you can usually you can usually find opposition to any anything successful from the other people that it's displacing, um, and uh, 
right now I think it should displace wind and solar energy, but but that's uh that that wasn't always the fear. <laughs> you have a sense of where this money is going or in a given year exactly how are they spending this money to try to oppose uh, nuclear power? Well, so most of those groups obviously have much broader agendas than just opposing nuclear power. Um, almost all of them, especially the big ones, are very, you know, they, they claim they want to protect the environment from carbon emissions, and yet they have a deliberate policy to block the most successful carbon, zero carbon energy form that is, and they all promote weather reliant, weather dependent wind and solar energy who, uh, at least in the case of the Rocky Mountain Institute, received some decent money from that industry, um, which obviously receives a whole bunch of funding from government. So we're kind of funding our own demise there as taxpayers. Um, and so I, I would, you know, their job is to, at this point, you know, the, the Sierra Club is, is sort of the, uh, uh, or, you know, the, the, the wind energy club in a lot of ways at this point. And, uh, and that's, that's, I think, where a lot of their agenda is focused on, uh, as far as energy goes anyway. So I jotted down a few uh, organizations or people that are kind of pro-nuke or James Hansen, uh, mm -hmm. famous warmest. Uh, Michael Schellenberger may have been against, but now he's a solidly pro. Obviously, yeah. Yeah, and Nature Conservancy, right? Yeah, the Nature Conservancy has has a uh, and uh, and let me just I mean they they are also the, the, this report I think it was put out in 2013 um, promotes a vast expansion of nuclear power, um, and they're a big NGO. Um, they buy up land to protect it. They promote nuclear energy as the zero carbon as a very important zero carbon. Uh, energy solution in addition to wind and solar, which I think is, um, I think that's, I think any group that's promoting wind and solar energy and subsidies for same is working at cross purposes with any desire, whatever they say, they appro approve of nuclear power. If you're promoting paving the world with solar panels, you're probably working against nuclear energy's rollout, which is what you should be working for, if that's really what your objective is. So is there such a uh, so much emphasis on safety in the U.S. that the plants have to be designed to take a hit from an airliner or an airplane? Is that, that part? That, that, yeah, I'm hardly a nuclear engineer, but uh, that is what I've heard from from more than one source that is um, that they're very that we we over engineer our nuclear plants because of out of an outsized fear of radiation. Um, you know, things like flying in airplanes, uh, living in high up in Colorado exposure you know the sun is a radiation source there are all we, we the the linear no threshold principle that any radiation is dangerous if it's coming from a nuclear reactor is pretty much the way we operate when we build these things these days and I mean if I were to write a a description of the three things we screw up about energy in America it would be the linear no threshold principle the levelized cost of electricity uh, fraud that compares, you know, the weather with dependent power sources as if they're co-equal with uh, uh, reliable energy sources, and the land conservation needs of the weather reliant power systems that people that think that we can live our lives on these these variable sources of energy don't get the idea that they chew up hundreds of times more land than nuclear, natural gas, and coal plants and you know, do. Do you think that the uh, positives of uh, nuclear energy are so uh, evident that they can't hold them back forever, that uh, there are places in the world where it's working well right now and it, it's going to happen? Um, I think that in a fair fight, that would definitely be the case. I, I worry about we, we, you know, right now it's being held hostage to the politics of this country the the current regime wants to the goldman sachs has estimated that the inflation reduction acts energy subsidies most of which are going to these weather dependent power systems and the the batteries that they think are going to store them could be as high as 1.2 trillion dollars just over the next 10 years i mean if you took all and i don't think any form of energy system should be subsidized to the tune of you know hundreds of billions, let alone trillion dollars. Uh, but if you're going to do it, why, why not roll out the most reliable carbon-free source of energy you've got? But again, 
what we say we want to do and what we spend money on um, are at cross purposes. And any optimism I have is greatly tempered by how long that kind of a silly policy stays in place. Uh, isn't there something going on with uh, Bill Gates uh, supporting something in maybe Idaho, some new technology? That he's yeah. Behind it? Yeah. So, yeah. And and he's he's not the only one, I don't know, pushing for you know, next level nuclear, nuclear energy systems. Um, and, and that's all to the good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't criticize that in and of itself, but we've had fission, good old, you know, fission reactors that we've developed over 70 plus years and we've gotten really good at them, right? Their, their capacity factor is 92%. They're the most reliable form of energy we have, the safest form of of reliable energy we have I, I i like the idea that we're coming up with you know fun new toys and experimenting with fission fusion and, and all of these things but we're really missing the boat on the thing that we we've already developed and we're good at we should be working toward that now immediately if carbon reduction is really what our objective is and um and definitely always pursue greater technology but um you know it, these things, even when they become developed, aren't going to just work perfectly out of the box. Um, they're going to require some trial and error that we've already done with fission reactors. So, and Do you think it is a big problem in the U.S. that they have suppressed uh, new nuclear plants for so long that uh, we're losing the skills? We don't have trained engineers? In Absolutely. Hugo, as, as you said, um, uh, when you know he he claims that you t you got to build three right if you build three really quickly, you get all of the expertise drilled in. You've got a you've got a a, 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 um, a domestic uh, labor pool and knowledge base to build them. You bring the cost down, which is the big criticism that is that is lobbed at nuclear energy now is that it's just so much more costly than these other things. Well, well, yeah, when each reactor is built every decade, it's a work of art, and, you know, not an not an uh, you know a comparative advantage assembly line system that we do with everything else. It's going to cost a lot. Um, if we you know we, we built our if we built our 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 much beloved uh, electric vehicles one at a time, they'd be pretty expensive. Or any vehicle one at a time, it would be very expensive as well. Um, I mean, I I just read a just the other day a, a wonderful thing by Mark Andreessen, the uh, tech investor about uh, he, he put up a techno optimists manifesto where he pointed out that in 1973, Richard Nixon proposed that we build a thousand nuclear plants by the year 2000. And, and, and Dreesen says, we should have done it then, we should still do it now. And he, claimed, he says that the greatest mistake by Western civilization in his lifetime was the suppression of nuclear energy, which he was born in 1971. He's an American. The Vietnam War took place. That's quite a statement, but I think um, it is somewhat defensible um, in that we we've just suppressed a major energy source. And energy is life. It's prosperity. It's it's what lifts people out of out of poverty and, and makes them wealthy. And to have to have shut this down is a it's 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 it, it should be criminal. Yeah, you text you uh, sent me the link to that. I'm going to put that up in the show description. That's a brilliant piece of work. It just was posted on October 16th of this year by Mark Andreessen. But he has got a lot of pull, doesn't he? Or when he talks, people listen. I, I'm encouraged by oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, he uh, he's been um, influential in the tech investing world for for you know a few decades now. He's a major Silicon Valley person. Um, and you know, he had a great interview with Elon Musk uh, a couple weeks back, maybe a month or so ago talking about artificial intelligence, um, which he's very high on and doesn't think the government should should do anything to to restrict. And in fact, he argues that if you put a lot of government restrictions on it, you're going to create a monopoly amongst the corporations and you're going to end up with a monster much worse. You're going to end up with exactly the monster ruling your lives that you're worried about rather than letting the technology loose to everyone and then everyone will end up building their own little AI he compared it to having a dog that you can train, to do whatever you like. And, and basically putting the government in charge of it is outlawing this your dog. <laughs> so um, for me as kind of an outsider, I, I think the general public in the U S what they know about nuclear power is what they've seen on the Simpsons. I think that's actually I, an important I, I, influence. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, 30 years. I mean, this, this is the longest running scripted uh, TV show in American history. And every Sunday when that thing comes on and, and, you know, how many reruns that occur on every in every TV market every single day. You know, hilarious show. I let my kids watch it when they were, you know, little too. Probably shouldn't have, but um, bad parenting. But anyway, I mean, every every episode shows Homer Simpson, the hapless, idiotic nuclear plant engineer, leaving the plant with a fuel rod stuck in the back of his shirt glowing. And and this is this is done, you know, I think great, you know, helped to to greatly damage uh, people's perception of it. Even with that, the perception is coming back. I read a poll from uh, Pew Research about a month or two back um, showing Americans are beginning to really favor it, uh, but not to the degree that they do wind and solar, uh, because, again, the propaganda is all with this weather dependent intermittent land grabbing eagle killing uh energy sources that we have that uh are uh, crowding out good ideas and and i should say i mean i i i talk like an advocate and i i i do appreciate the things i i think it's a wonderful uh technology that we've really missed the boat on but i wouldn't subset if in a perfect world we'd let nuclear compete on a fair field with all of the other energy sources, and I think it would win out. But right now, it it is being, you know, Robert Bryce has done great work on just the the, the just you know hundreds of times more uh, dollars per kilowatt hour that that wind and solar receive over and above every single other energy source. So we're not serious about cutting carbon emissions. At least the people who yell about it the most are not serious about it when they put a nickel into a wind and solar subsidy. So do you think that depiction of nuclear power in The Simpsons is just played for laughs? Or do you think anybody influenced them in any way that this is a great way to make people fear this type of power? I hope it's uh, I just think, for laughs. I, I think the creators of The Simpsons grew up in the, in you know, were probably teenagers, young adults in the era with uh, Three Mile Island and, and, and the, uh, you know, the anti-nuclear movement, movement that preceded that and, internalize the fact that you can make people laugh by you know comedy is is making fun of tragedy in some sense so that's an easy that's an easy laugh and 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 that's what they went for so uh does the capital research center do you do any work at all pushing back against the just the climate scam in general yeah so we do a whole lot on um the esg um investing movement uh I've, I've personally written a lot about BlackRock and and some of the ESG um, labels of Ceres and, um, and and the like. Uh, we we do that, uh, and you know I, I I I guess I'm the 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 primary climate person there right now, and they pretty much let me do whatever I want. I call myself a, a jack of all trades, master of some. I've I've gotten into um, healthcare and and budgets and corporate welfare, all kinds of things over a few, you know, a couple of decades in this business. Um, and right now I'm kind of fixated on the energy sphere, at least for the last couple of years. And you have looked then to the funding then of some of these groups as they're uh, trying to push the climate propaganda. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've done profiles of, of, of the aforementioned groups that are the anti-nuclear groups. And also more importantly, groups like, um, the Bloomberg Philanthropies, one of the biggest philanthropic foundations in the country, is a major donor to a whole bunch of the aforementioned groups that I just, you know, talked about. The the all, all of the the anti energy climate groups. Bloomberg is a big funder of most of the big ones. The MacArthur Foundation, another major um, uh, donor foundation. Um, Arabella Advisors, the one I mentioned off the top, also funds a lot of these groups, and and even. Some of them, the, the, you know, some of the donors we've looked at, people have never heard of a, a billionaire from North Carolina named Fred Stanback, who gives a lot of money through a group called the Foundation for the Carolinas. Um, Mr. Stanback uh, opposes nuclear energy. He uh, is a, he opposes immigration. He's in, you know, funds a lot of pro-abortion groups and um, and anti-population groups. So it, it's really you know, you can have one of those positions and, and have kind of, you know, iconoclastic views on the other. But when you put all that together, 
Mr. Stanback is just an anti-humanist environmentalist. I mean, people are the problem in in his uh, in his in his world, and he 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 puts uh, you know he's put upwards of a billion dollars possibly over his lifetime into funding anybody that will will stop people from from flourishing and and populating. <laughs> Did you have an opinion? Is it Amory Lovins that you uh, were talking about with Hugo? Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, Amory Lovins. He's the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute. He, back in the 70s, worked for Friends of the Earth. Amory Lovins is kind of patient zero for the anti-nuclear movement. Um, Michael Schellenberger, you mentioned before, Schellenberger credits Lovins with being the guy who convinced the Sierra Club to switch their position, I believe. The Sierra Club used to be in favor of nuclear energy. Um uh, I believe Ansel Adams, if I remember right, was was a was a Sierra Club member, pro nuclear, um, and they made a decision. They they got on board with the the fierce anti nuclear movement back in the uh, back in the late sixties, early seventies. Um, California stopped building nuclear reactors, you know, because of them. I mean, imagine Cal- imagine where we'd be right now if California had gone aggressively to nuclear energy. And, you know, California, unfortunately, has trends that waft across the United States and 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 influence all other policy. We, we'd be a very different country right now. We would have one of our major debates about energy and climate would be effectively ended because we would have this. And, you know, that that's kind of what I'm about in all of the public policy stuff I do. I'd like to I don't need to win debates. Right. I, I, I I'm not a really that partisan to nuclear energy, but compromise is how you, things work in a democratic process. So if we're going to spend billions of dollars subsidizing something to save carbon, to stop carbon emissions, let's subsidize nuclear energy and, you know, other ways that we could compromise to fix things like healthcare and all those, you know, if I could fix all of these problems with, with solutions like that, then, you know, I, I quit this and go back to writing about college football and hiking in Yosemite and the things that I like better. <laughs> so as you look at uh, how funding is flowing, do you see any funding going to, there's like a group called Climate Defiance where it looks like they're flying around the country and shouting down people who are trying to speak and uh, people blocking roads. Uh, maybe, I don't know about if Extinction Rebellion is anywhere in your uh, in your. I have, I have written an extensive profile for our magazine on Extinction Rebellion that I referred to as Unabombers Without Bombs because they remind me a lot of the early Ted Kaczynski. You know, he didn't he didn't start off sending mail bombs to all of the pro technology people that he opposed. He started off just trying to sabotage the Industrial Revolution from his own little place in the world and found out that he couldn't succeed that way. And he got progressively more violent. Um, Extinction Rebellion is right about where Ted was in the early days of, of you know, standing down in intersections and and you know, gluing themselves to to uh, to to buildings and things like that. Um, that's not going to get it done as far as what they're attempting. Uh, so I speculate, you know, how, how long before they're they're they, they've they've made statements that there's no there's we, we there's no nothing in the way of this, nothing should be standing in the way of this objective. So at what point do they take the next step uh, that logically pursue, you know, the next level of interference in order to, to accomplish the objectives that they say there's no compromise on uh, there. They've expressed some Marxist, you know, the, they, they've, they've blatantly said in, in some cases that getting rid of capitalism is their objective Um so anyway, uh, that that's I, I've done work with I've, them. I've never heard of climate defiance. Sounds like a similar type of uh, of movement. Um, obviously, Earth First did some did did some um, destruction and at any rate, criminal destruction of property. What and when they were uh, blocking uh, logging and the like back in the, I believe in the eighties. So the, these are groups that should be watched from from. From that perspective, interestingly, though, as far as following the funding of them, sometimes it's hard. I mean, there's no people that will occasionally announce that they funded Extinction Rebellion, but at least in its early days, there was no organization, you know, formal organization that was receiving money. And some of these groups are just like that. They they come up with a name, they come up with a loose 
you know, what is Antifa? Nobody funds Antifa, but there's a group, you know, they wave flags. There, there are people claiming the, claiming the label. And uh, sometimes you, you have to report on what they do and what they say they're going to do and just speculate on where the money's coming from. There's this narrative that climate skeptics are supposed to be getting big funding. Willie Soon has, uh, is funded by Exxon, et cetera, the Heartland Institute. Uh, have you found anything to, to back that up? I have not seen anything. I think that's not even true. Yeah, it, it's to the extent that any of these supposed, you know, I've been accused of getting money from the Koch brothers ever since I began working in public policy think tanks. I can tell you, to my knowledge, and I've worked at like three or four of them now, um, the most I've ever received from the Koch brothers, to my knowledge, um, was a beer once at a conference. <laughs> Somebody that worked for the Koch brothers or for Americans for Prosperity bought me a drink. So that that's the limit of uh, my, my wife is more of a slave to diet Coke. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's it's vastly exaggerated, um, and to the extent that they receive this fund from any energy companies, it's much smaller than what Bloomberg alone is sending to the aforementioned anti-nuclear groups. So um, we, we've at Capital Research Center, we, we do track funding on the, on the right center, but our, our research and the research of, of, of others and you know um, media parties have calculated that the advantage that the left has over the right in NGO funding and of this sort is about three or four to one. So our our ratio of, of uh, following the money follows that pattern. So I'm just looking at this uh, list of the articles that you've written. I'm going to put the that in the show notes too. But uh, you're extremely productive, tons of articles out there. Do you want to talk about your exceedingly rare incidents about uh, wind turbine failures? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I just posted uh, about a profile um, on our website, a four-part profile. I, it was initially going to be a 700-word blog, and I kept digging, and Nextera kept uh, covering, you know, adding more stuff to it because of, of their um, rather uh, extensive uh, reputation. They are... It, it, NextEra is one of the biggest uh, power utilities in the country. Uh, they began as Florida Power and Light, building, uh, creating energy the old-fashioned way with nuclear and hydrocarbons and the like. Um, around about the time of the Obama era in the uh, stimulus, they figured out that they could fund the business with other people's money, which is getting subsidies to build their wind wind energy facilities out, getting taxpayer subsidies to build their infrastructure. And then you have these renewable energy mandates from state and local governments forcing people to buy the power. So NextEra had a mandated customer and a subsidized infrastructure. Put those two together, they had pretty much a license to print money and became briefly the same size as Exxon back uh, in 2020. They had the same market gap. Uh, NextEra has fallen on very hard times since then. And Exxon has gotten very uh, gotten very strong. Now Exxon's four times the size. But yeah, uh, NextEra's wind turbines have, um, there's a section in there where I point out the number of times the wind turbines have caught on fire, fallen over, thrown blades, on and on and so forth, over like a 10-year period from 2013 to present. And in, these are just the media accounts. Who knows how many incidents have happened that didn't end up in the media. And in every case, every one of these cases, I think I did like six or eight of them for the profile, that's, that the next era official runs in and says, well, this is exceedingly rare. This doesn't, he uses the same words every time, or they use the same words every time. And in one case, I found the same guy, the same spokesperson, three times in the span of one month, three different incidents in three different states where he ran in each time and told the local media, this is rare. It doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> Um, so, and, and now, uh, what, one of the reasons next is having troubles is that the turbine industry is finding out that they do have a problem. The, the turbines are, are malfunctioning and the repairs are estimate, the repair estimates are going through the roof. And, uh, even with, even with this grotesque amount of government subsidies they're receiving, the wind industry is now, as Robert Bryce has pointed out, is having trouble 
getting their projects off the ground because of their own technical problems. Um, and that's before we get to the land use and the killing the eagles and the intermittent power, all the other problems with it. They can't even keep, you know, even when the wind is blowing, the things can catch on fire and fall over and throw blades and, and the like. I mean, imagine imagine what we would be saying about the nuclear power industry if it had three incidents in space of one month and some some guy from Westinghouse is running around going, it's completely rare. This isn't happening a lot, right? So, so what is your sense uh, in the real world if they put up a new wind turbine in Iowa? Uh, how long on average is it before they have to uh, put it in a landfill? Yeah, I think the the quoted average is is I think twenty years maybe. Um, in a lot of these cases, uh, one of the instances that I was I pointed out in the article. It had been running for four years before the malfunction happened, um, and and that's and that's another thing. These blades, a lot of, a lot gets made and overblown regarding the the waste issue in nuclear energy, which is we can get into a lot more solvable than it's um or not even as much of a problem as d- debated. But uh, wind turbine blades are because they have to spin and and hold together ideally. Um, they have to be built very, very tough. Well, they can't be recycled into anything else as a result of the the engineering to make this really strong composite, and they don't break. I mean, they, they do not decompose. So you can you can find online, and and uh, if, you know, Bryce has done some has put up some of these photos of just. Oh, I'm sorry, Doomberg put up these photos of these wind turbine blades laying in these landfills, just like you know, corpses one after the other, and they're going to be there forever. And 20 years, you got to take them down. I mean, how many, and, and these, if you've driven by a wind turbine, you know, there's, you know, dozens of square miles just for one facility. How many of these blades are we going to end up with? And the materials to make them are are increasing in cost because of, um, of these matters as well. So it's, it, it all of the problems that, that are, lodged at nuclear energy apply in some sense to the wind and solar in- industry waste um you know the cost all of these things but they just get ignored you know in, in uh, out of a i think misplaced or even corrupt uh support for a favored energy source or a or just a hostility toward having a lot of energy do you think there's anybody on Earth right now that believes that wind turbines in any way follow Moore's law and the wind, the technology is going to get a lot better? Uh, you know, it's going to get twice as uh, good as it is now uh, anytime soon. Well, certainly the levelized cost of electricity f- believers do. That's what gets cited when they claim that wind and wind is becoming co-equal and or even cheaper in cost than, say, natural gas. Um, that's a misuse of a statistic that was supposed to be used to compare two reliable energy sources. It just compares the average price of creating power. Well, that's great if you're comparing two things where the light switch goes on whenever you want it to, but comparing levelized cost of energy to a wind and solar system, you know, ignores the fact that one of the most valuable things about electricity is when it's created, not how much you got. You would certainly take a house that had, you know, fixed amount of energy that is reliable versus can you imagine how much how much value would a free furnace be if you lived in Canada you've got a free furnace but it only works when the sun shines or the wind blows well that's real great you know it's free it's free electricity it's a free furnace and you're freezing in February right this thing's worthless you can't compare the levelized cost of energy of a furnace that works all the time that maybe costs twice as much as one that only works intermittently. And that's the, uh, that's the, you know, the fallacy that gets used by the people that claim that we're just going to keep bringing this price down. We're going to just keep bringing it down. We're going to get that Moore's log. They're not even close to that right now. And now they're, and now the, uh, the wind turbines, even with all the subsidies are malfunctioning, failing, and their, their business models coming apart, even with, hundreds of billions of dollars being shoveled at them. I think it might have been Alex Epstein that came up with a good analogy. I think that how much would you pay for a car that only works an unpredictable one third of the time? 
Like, yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't, you cannot, it's just not energy if it isn't reliable. It's, it's, you, you know, you're not a real industrial nation if you can't make, if your power source is, is intermittent. And the more, you know, you know, I, I'm sure you've discussed this on your show before that the more renewables you put on your grid, you have to have the same backup power and the reliable energy sources for when your renewables don't work. So you're doubling the cost of your energy system. There's no way you're, you're bringing the cost down when you still have to have the same nuclear coal, natural gas plants to work when they're supposed to. It's like having, you know, running a restaurant on cheap employees who may or may not show up on time and you're punishing the ones that do. So. Do you have any sense or any update on how a local pushback is going? Do you think uh, people are getting more organized and uh, pushing back uh, when they're trying to put in these huge facilities near their houses? So, yeah, I, the, there's Robert Bryce's renewable rejection database is a place you should go to to kind of follow the, the winners, the people that have beaten the system and and pushed out uh, uh, energy firms like NextEra that want to, I mean, it, it want to put up these things. I mean, it's a real... It's a human rights issue, too, uh, when you consider there are people that move out to parts of this country with wide open spaces, of which there are still many. And, you know, you can move out and have no light pollution, a, a sky full of stars at night, and then a company like NextEra comes in and puts up a dozen square miles of flashing red lights all over your horizon. That's 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 to get trivial amounts of energy. Um, those are the people that are opposing these things. And uh, and wind turbines, some, one of the uh, items I put in that profile of NextEra was an incident where a wind turbine, I mean, when these things catch on fire, they put them up on big poles, right, in a windy area. Well, when the machine catches on fire in that circumstance, by design, you're probably going to have a lot of wind blowing and blowing the fire and the debris all over the place. Uh, you know, that, that's another factor people are opposing. And um Bryce has been tracking this for, I think, 10 years now and come up with a number of, you know, his his trend line is definitely up. More and more communities are figuring out how to block them. However, a pushback has come in the other way. Where I live in Michigan, they're trying to pass a law to the, the legislature at the behest of the governor is trying to pass a law to preempt local rejections. So local communities that want to vote against putting wind and solar facilities in their communities, the state government wants to be able to say, no, you can't do that. You got to take it. Um, where that turns out, that's happened. I think that's, I think there's such a law in New York already. Um, I think you, you could end up with that being a very uh, um, bitter uh, fought battle in a lot of states that nobody's really thinking of right now as legislatures and governors switch hands back and forth. Um, a battle over whether they should have local control in those situations uh, could become a, a real defining issue of our politics in the next uh, coming elections. I had not even heard about that. You think that uh, the bad guys, from my perspective, won in New York right now? But uh, I, I think they have, from, from some of my, I, I've, I've been meaning to look into it, but I've seen references to that, um, that they that, that there's communities that have to accept at least solar plants maybe it was i don't quote me on that but i new, new york new yorkers have a harder time blocking these things than than others from what i was able to discern doing some of this research and you know michigan for sure has this has this teed up whether it passes or not probably depends on um our state senate switched to democratic control this last election for the first time since 1983. Um, so a whole bunch of pent up angry left center policy demands came bursting over the dam since then. And uh, because this is the first time since 1983, Democrats have had total control of the legislature and the governor's office. So they're, they're feeling a lot of muscle about being able to push through stuff like this right now. And, um, you know, this is their one opportunity. Now, what might stop it is the state Senate um, a lot of those state senators were elected in districts where, you know, like I said, this could be a real battle line in our politics in the next coming years. And it may, if Michigan's dumb enough to pursue this, that may be the thing that that 
influences a lot of these Senate seats, people getting angry about their senator voting for this, this state preemption um, because in the House, there's enough um, people that represent regions that are not likely to have wind turbines, urban, suburban areas. But the Senate, you know, the districts are big enough that some, you know, that the, the, there's just more more of them proportionally have have constituents who might be upset about this sort of uh, meddling in their local affairs and with their homes, frankly. Could you remind me again, uh, what is the scale of the wind and solar spending in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act? And do you think that money is actually going to be spent for sure or can it be blocked later? Oh, well, anything, I guess, can be undone with the exception of, um, you know, uh, by a, a subsequent Congress and president uh, voting differently. Uh, I would assume there would be some contract stipulations for grants that were already handed out. Um so yes, it can be undone. The initial estimate from the Congressional Budget Office was something on the order of 300 to 400 billion dollars over over a decade. Um, on but the the uh, the language is such that it isn't really capped. And Goldman Sachs noted this and pointed out that the actual spending could be high as as high over the next 10 years as 1.2 billion dollars. So, or $1.2 trillion, yes, four times or three, three to four times the initial projection. The Congressional Budget Office was apparently estimating how many people would use these subsidies, whereby, whereas if it's not, if it's an unlimited amount, then Goldman Sachs looked at it and said, well, just how ridiculous could this get? They didn't say it that way. They were cheerleading for it. But my my version of their number is this is how silly it could get, $1.2 trillion. Um, you know, I mean, divide that out, $1.2 trillion. Even the Vogel nuclear reactor that was just opened in Georgia was about $30 billion, And that was twice the initial cost, way over budget, a complete, you know, Worst case scenario, if we built another one tomorrow and the next day, as Hugo says, we would get an economy of scale going and these things would be cheaper. But just divide 1.2 trillion by 30 billion for a thousand megawatt reactor that can light up 800,000 homes. I mean, how far could we get, you know, divide that money out as just subsidies or, or, or loan guarantees or however you want to do it, you'll end up with these reliable energy sources, these carbon-free energy sources that can last for 80 years versus, you know, tiny amounts of land versus these wind turbines that are soaking up hundreds of times the land for trivial amounts of power and everybody hates looking at them and, and they're, you know, ruining landscapes and wildlife. Um, it's it's hard to, hard to exaggerate how irrational the policy is of spending that kind of money on those things. And then the battery storage to store the intermittent power when, you know, nuclear energy, coal, natural gas, they're their own battery. <laughs> they store the, they store the energy themselves. You know, the, the energy source stores itself until you need it. Um, it, it just, we're, we're trying to reinvent the wheel when we've already invented some, some pretty fast wheels. I just looked it up here. Uh, Warren Buffett's quote, I think, is extremely important here. Quote, he said, we get a tax credit if we build a lot of wind farms. That's the only reason to build them. They don't make sense without the tax credit, end quote. Yeah. I, Saying the quiet part out loud, absolutely. <laughs> but he's still doing it, right? They're doing it uh, well, at great course. scale. Uh, yeah. Of course. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I joke even though I disagree with their a lot of their politics on both ways, I think you you could get by uh, living a pretty a pretty smart life if you just followed the advice of Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett and <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, is is there any chance that uh, private investment in real power, like n nuclear power, that just private the economics could be so compelling that they could just uh, with no subsidies, no help from the government, just put them up and uh, and compete against this ridiculous wind power. I think if I, I think I think if the wind power wasn't getting subsidies as well, yes. Um, and another option would be, I mean, you mentioned Bill Gates before, 
and and I think Bill Gates is probably not the only uh, billionaire who who is playing around with the advanced nuclear to to use a you know overused and vague phrase. Imagine if Bill Gates and Elon Musk or or Bloomberg for that for that matter, any of these guys said, you know what? Um, I, I think to save the to save the Earth, I'm going to build some good old fashioned fission reactors and 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 begin to build a lot of them so we get good at it and bring the cost down. Rather than play around with all the the, the new stuff, I'm going to just focus on the thing that works and show that it works. Because if I do that and bring the cost down, I'm going to bring more people into it. That would work. And it's too bad that it's not being done. And the only other thing I'd written down was um, that, you know, the, the battery end of these things. Um, I, I did a, I did an S or a, a, an item. If you remember the energy secretary, Jennifer Granholm, back at the beginning of the summer, I believe, had decided, had announced that we're going to turn all of our military vehicles into electric vehicles. Um, the the Doomberg substack, which I highly recommend to everybody, um, did a great profile of how silly this was, uh, just on the scale of turning an M1 Abrams main battle tank into run it on batteries. And they pretty much concluded that you'd need to drag along another vehicle that weighed like half again as much as the tank as the battery to get it around. Then you'd have to charge the thing, and it would take. I mean, these things are you know sixty tons or. So just just the fuel cell would 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 add tens of tons to the thing. Um, great profile, funny thing that they did, typical of how well Doomberg uh, covers these matters. But something that they left out, which I have personal experience with because I live in Michigan and lived under Governor Granholm, was how bonkers about batteries she was when she was governor here. She during the uh, the Obama um, stimulus program. January 2009, A123 Systems got a battery system subsidy in Michigan. Governor announces that we're going to be the alternative capital of energy capital of North America. August 2009, Dow Cocam, another battery plant. Granholm again says this is going to make us the advanced battery capital of the world. July 2010, LG Chem, battery system in Michigan for EV vehicles. She announces this is making us the North American battery capital. All of these getting stimulus money, all of them getting even more taxpayer goodies from the taxpayers of Michigan, every single one of them dead in the water, either shortly after they opened or before they even got to the finish line. <laughs> so why would she even bring this up, though? Doesn't that indicate that there's no adults in the room at all if she's talking about battery-powered military tanks? I generally try and stay to the high road when I'm doing policy analysis. But I have to say, um, I have a saying that the average or the dumbest electrician you can find, the dumbest electrician you can find, knows more about energy than the average politician. Okay? I mean, th that's provable just by the way they voted on this Inflation Reduction Act, right? Governor Granholm, Energy Secretary Granholm now, knows about as much about electricity as my cat. So, I mean, she's proved it over her entire career, which is how I concluded that 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 essay about her uh, her battery failures. OK, they're kind of depressing, but uh, maybe <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of a worse person to put in the job than she has. It's 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 very depressing that, that anybody looked at that history and said, you know what, this is the person we should put in charge of our energy system, you know, so. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, anything else you want to cover before we go ahead and wrap up here? Yeah, no, that's all. Um, you want to read some more of this, uh, capitalresearch.org. And again, influencewatch.org uh, covers our, uh, our influence covering the uh, public policy influencers and following the money. All right. And you do have a donate button out there, right? At uh, capitalresearch.org. Yeah. Absolutely. Our, our motto, as far as any of this stuff is steal our stuff. If you want to share it and please help us, uh, Help us create more of it if you're so inclined. A good place to find you also is on Twitter at uh, Bron Ken, right? I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. Yep, so that, that's that's where um uh, don't don't hold my employer responsible for that or stuff I say at football games. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Likewise, Tom. Thank you for the invitation. Talk to you, talk to you next time.